Hello, welcome to worship here at Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Santa Monica, California. I'm Pastor Eric Schaefer, the senior pastor here at Mount Olive, and we're so glad that you've taken some time to worship with us on this second Sunday in Lent. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ our Lord, let us with confidence draw near to God that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great mercy, wash away our iniquity and cleanse us from sin. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not remove us from your presence. Do not take your spirit away. Restore unto us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your spirit. Amen. God is merciful and gracious, granting forgiveness through Jesus Christ to all who confess their sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, friends. Come take a seat and join me for today's children's sermon. In today's gospel, we hear Jesus say that whoever wants to be his disciple must deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow him. How do we pick up our crosses and follow Jesus? Do we have to carry a big heavy cross around with us everywhere we go? Woo! so heavy. Do we? No, we don't. When we are baptized in the waters of baptism, we are marked with the cross of Christ. And even though the oil that we are marked with washes off, that cross never does. That cross is always right there, sitting on your forehead, reminding you that you are a child of God. And God's love is inside your heart and goes with you wherever you go. We are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, and we are made new in God's love. We carry that love and that cross with us, and we go out into the world, and we help others. We give up everything so that we can be a disciple of Jesus and follow him to the cross where we know he will die for our sins because he loved us so, so much. Say a prayer with me, friends. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we give you thanks that you have made us new and filled us with your love and baptism. We remember that we wear that cross upon our forehead. Help us to go out into the world and share with everyone we meet that Jesus loves them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first lesson is written in the 17th chapter of Genesis, beginning at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the law appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, 
As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is written in the fourth chapter of Romans, beginning at the 13th verse. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give me Jesus. 
This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and again three days later rise. Jesus said it quite openly this time. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus then rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It was the third Sunday in Lent, 2020, last year. That was the Sunday on which we began our online weekly worship services. We pulled that first service together in just, just days before, just as everything was shutting down. Samantha, Jose, Jeremy, and I pulled it together with Evan White as our camera operator. We did it live on Facebook, and then with Maxine's and Carolyn's help, put that recording up on our congregation's YouTube site. Now nearly 60 online worship services later. Yes, I said nearly 60 online worship services later. Now nearly 60 online worship services later. That first effort looks pretty well down and dirty, as they say. But we were and are still proud of it, considering how quickly we were able to react. Of course, last March we had no idea we'd still be offering worship online only one year later. But that's the case. We seem to be, we are, in a Lenten season that has lasted for a year, with more Lent to come. We pastors, we actually like Lent, a time of reflection, a pause of remembering who and whose we are. We pastors, we actually like Lent. And we like Lent because it's a season that truly belongs to the church alone. Christmas, well, you know how commercial that holiday can be. Easter's better, but there's still that bunny and all those candy and those eggs. Lent, however, belongs to us Christians. No one wants to secularize it, or if they tried, even could. And the world's not much interested in a holiday, if you will, that marks the death of the Savior of humankind. Now, some folks try. Several years ago, I was part of a pre-screening of Mel Gibson's then-new film, The Passion of the Christ. Gibson was there to introduce the film, a tribute to his very conservative Roman Catholic faith. After the screening, I wrote a review that was picked up by many newspapers and even People magazine, in which I said the film was, The Gospels meet Ben-Hur meets Braveheart. It was and is not my favorite film about Jesus, not by a long shot. As I said, the, the world's not much interested in a holiday that marks, makes so much of death that marks so much death. Regardless, I usually like Lent because it gives us an opportunity, an excuse, if you will, to slow down and reflect, to look both inward and outward and to evaluate our lives. As we say on Ash Wednesday, it's a time for us to remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return, to try to reflect on what really is or should be important in our lives, to refocus ourselves on what is or should be important in our lives. However, I never imagined, no one ever imagined, that we would be in the midst of a Lent that has lasted all year, a seemingly never-ending Lent. A seemingly never-ending Lent with COVID-19 deaths now topping 500,000 in the USA alone, and economic destruction for individuals, families, businesses, and even nations. There are literally ashes everywhere. 
You may have seen an article in the Los Angeles Times a week times a week or so ago, an article about Diego Pablo, who is the longtime and now overworked cremation supervisor at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery here in Los Angeles. I was reminded of this article by a Lenten reflection written by Pastor Angela Denker, a reflection which helped me greatly with this sermon. According to Brittany Major's story in the Los Angeles Times, Diego Pablo has worked alone for a long time at the Hollywood Forever Crematorium, burning bodies into ashes for grieving families. However, there's so many bodies to burn this year with the devastation of COVID-19, so many bodies that the cemetery has had to add a second crematory worker to help burn the bodies. The article notes that like unlike, unlike, unlike too many, that the article notes that unlike too many Americans, Pablo has excellent job security these days in the midst of a pandemic. He is not a first responder, but certainly a last responder to this terrible disease. And like first responders and others who are employed to clean up after others more privileged than themselves, Pablo cannot take a vacation or get away from his important work. Instead, he lives with a pandemic's toll every day. Not long ago, Pablo contracted the virus himself, perhaps not surprising considering his work. The virus spread through the apartment he shares with his two cousins. Pablo survived, but not without a lot of heartache. In the article, Pablo tells the LA Times that after contracting the, violent, the virus, he thought it might help him feel the pain and tears of the families whose loved ones he is cremating. Instead, Pablo notes, quote, nothing comes out. I feel nothing. Sometimes I worry I have a hard heart, a cold heart, but I think that's what's helped me do this job for so long. Pablo and his new assistant cremated 58 people in January, up from just 17 last January. A nearby crematorium had to shut down temporarily because their constant burning violated California clean air restrictions, even though those restrictions have been temporarily somewhat lifted to allow for more cremations. And another mortuary stopped allowing family members to observe cremations. It just took too much extra time. There were just too many bodies and so many ashes. The fire of death raises, rages, and it's no surprise that becoming cold and hard to death is the way Pablo must cope with this important work. So Pablo keeps working with his heart alternatively breaking open and snapping shut. There are just so many deaths, so many ashes. There's work and bills and food and rent. That's life these days. Thus this Lent, this year-long Lent, is so different from past Lents in our lives. Lent is usually at least an annual reminder of our own mortality. <laughs> this year we do not need such a reminder. Death surrounds us, haunts us, dwells in, our, in the bodies of those first and last responders who guard our days. This is just the way it's been for a year now. We live in the ever-present shadow of a global pandemic. And this pandemic has spawned so much worse, so much more. Violence, tension, political upheaval, distrust, depression, suicide. And on top of all this, in the midst of all this, the twin crises of climate and racism have really come home to us across the USA and around the world. This is not the Lent I wanted. This is not the Lent any of us wanted. Like so many of you, I long for a return to what I remember as normal, when we could gather in person again for worship, when schools and jobs can reopen safely, when extended families can gather again in person, when we can travel, eat indoors in a restaurant, when we might feel safe again. So many things we long for. And yet, perhaps this is the Lent I needed, the Lent we all needed, a time to be in solidarity with Pablo and the millions of others who have lived in the shadow of death for so long. This year, Lent is about God's unimaginable ability to pull life out of death. God's unimaginable ability to pull life out of death, creation out of dust, green buds from brittle branches, forgiveness out of anger and fear. Lent this year is about the gift of hope. We already know, we are assured that God can embrace the imperfect you and me. This year in a Lent coupled with too many ashes and too many deaths, the gift of hope is that God still dwells in our midst. In the acknowledgement of suffering, death, and pain, 
God is glorified. In the cross of Jesus, our ashes, the ashes of loved ones long dead and newly lost, in the cross of Jesus Christ, our ashes merge with the promise of new life that rises from the cremains of our own lives. This is not the Lent I wanted. This is not the Lent we wanted. This is the Lent we have received. It is the Lent of a God who walked himself to death and grief and pain and shame, refusing to advert his eyes so that when I enter grief and death myself, when we enter grief and death ourselves, we find God right next to us. This is the Lent we did not want, but it is the Lent we have, and it is the Lent we all need. It is the Lent of God's unimaginable ability to pull life from death, creation out of dust, green buds from brittle branches, forgiveness out of anger and fear. It is the Lent of hope. It is the Lent of God always right next to us. It is the Lent we need. God is right next to us, this Lent, this year, always. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words we know as the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under, under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our prayers of intercession, after each section, I will say, hear us, O God. Please repeat with me, your mercy is great. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving, especially all those suffering from COVID-19 and their families and friends. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Bless the work of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, and all those working to reunite children taken from their parents at our border with their parents. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of the Lord be with you. 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 Once again, thank you for joining us here for worship at Mount Olive, for taking time from your safer at home days and spending it with us. Our weekly schedule continues as it has been, as you heard me say in my sermon, now for a year. Each week we offer a new pre-recorded worship service that's available to you on our YouTube site on Saturday afternoon. I send an email out every Saturday about 3 p.m. to everyone for whom I have an email address, giving them the URL, the address, the link to that Sunday's new worship service. In that same email, I invite those who would like to join us on a Sunday morning around 9 a.m. when a group of us watch the worship service together and have a little fellowship. If you'd like to be added to this email list, I'd be happy to do so. Send me an email to pastor at mtolivelutheranchurch.org and I'll get you on the list. And as you see, we also have people who help us with the worship service. We have people who read lessons, we have people who lead the prayers, we have people who give a pass from the peace wave and, and help us with music. If you'd like to help us with worship in any way, send me an email to pastor at 
mtoliveLutheranChurch.org. And as I always say, thank you, thank you for your prayers and for your financial gifts, which are so vital to us in these times. You can make a gift to Olive by check, payable to Mount Olive, and sent in the U.S. mail to 1343 Ocean Park Boulevard, Santa Monica, California, 90405. If you're local, you can put your cash or, or uh, check offering through the uh, secure mail slot in our church office door. And we have two ways to give electronically, through Venmo, venmo.com slash Mount Olive, and through our website, mtolivelutheranchurch.org. Just follow the giving button and you can make a gift from your savings, checking account, or credit card, a one-time gift, or a regular gift. However you support us, we are so grateful. Thank you. For our thanksgiving for the word, after each paragraph, I will say, for your word of life, O God, and we'll all stay together, we give you thanks and praise. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. And now, O Lord, send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call upon you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us pray together the words we know as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. And now, let us go in peace and serve the poor. Thanks be to God. Writing in our land, writing with power and with love. Our conflicts and our fears, our triumphs and our tears are recorded by the right hand of God. The right hand of God is pointing in our land, pointing the way that we must go. So clouded is the way, so easily we stray, but we're and lust, our pride and deeds unjust, are destroyed by the right hand of God. The right hand of God is healing in our land, healing broken bodies, mind and souls. So wondrous is its touch, with love that means so much, when we're healed by the right hand of God. When we're healed by the right hand of God.